Basketball is in the air. The NBA regular season is about a week or so away. Let's continue our preview by looking at all 30 defenses, ranking them 1 to 30. Welcome to Chuck and Darts, a podcast of informed, rigorous, reckless, harmless, speculative, and fun predictions about the game we love. And you can call me Chuck. This is episode number 213. Episode number 212 was the preview episode ranking offenses 1 to 30. That was with Charlie Cummings, who works for Swish Theory. He is at Claytheist11. Please be sure to check that out. Uh, and for the defensive side of the ball, I wanted to have back for the second consecutive year, Matt Issa. He is a man of many talents, many publications. If you follow this stuff closely, you know his work. Uh he works for Opta Analyst, Fan Sighted, Forbes, and Basketball Insiders. Uh, recently became, a, I believe, a brand ambassador for Basketball Reference. And he uh, forced, I would say, maybe some ripples. I wouldn't call them waves quite, but certainly ripples in the ongoing Dante DiVincenzo, New York Knicks, uh, you know, relationship. In, in the relationship by reporting on some sort of dissatisfaction there. Both sides denied it, and then Dante and Jalen Brunson's father had a fun little tete-a-tete. So, welcome back, Matt. How are you? You know, a lot better after that introduction. Um, <laughs> feeling pretty good about myself after that. No, I'm just kidding. It feels good to be back on, Chuck. I feel like every time me and you potted out, it's just really good to see you. We haven't talked since Summer League. Yeah, we did get uh, to see each other in summer. Yeah, like, we oh, did. That was nice. Well, why'd you say it like that? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing you now. Like, I thought that was like one of the highlights of my trip was seeing you. Oh, yeah. No, for me, it was Saturday. No, no, I just <laughs> I, I say it that way because I uh, I really rarely get to see people in person. Mm. And so it's summer league. I try to see as many people in person as I can. And so, like, it's it's just nice to be able to it just it seems in my life man mm -hmm. that it like i it comes and goes very quickly i will say that my life is kind of a blur most days and so yes you were you were part of a very happy blur it was very nice to see you i'll, I'll take that i'll take that <laughs> um but yeah i'm doing i'm doing pretty good i recently re-looked at our predictions from last year i learned some important things um, I think the big thing I learned is that you wait, am I am I overstepping? Am I allowed to give my lessons? Yeah, give your lessons. Go. Okay, okay. I don't know if you want to formally ask me, but um no, I learned no, no, no. I learned that you should probably I'm an, I'm account, an amateur, Matt. Go ahead. You should probably account for when a team's going to be bad at the end of the year, because that might do something to their defensive rating. Um, I think that was a big, big takeaway. Mm-hmm. Another takeaway, like, you know, OKC Thunder, Orlando Magic, really good, really good defensive personnel there. Uh, yeah. They're probably going to rank pretty highly in defensive rating. No, it's, dude, so the point of, I, you were being a little tongue-in-cheek mm -hmm. about saying, you know, if they're going to be bad, their defense is going to be bad. But I think with defense, one thing that I've learned from doing this work is that Defense is not something you can really you it's hard to specialize in defense as a team. It's hard mm -hmm. to say we are going to seek out players so that we are really, really, really good defensively, and that's our our identity and the offense will just sort of lag behind. The only team that that I think really applied to last year was the magic. They're the only team that really was like, Great defense, clearly questionable offense. And that's just because offensive talent in the NBA is so extreme that lots of times an offense, as long as it executes well, will beat very good defense. That's the whole great offense beats great defense cliche that is still pretty true. But uh, there, for me, you look for things like what sort of culture has a team established? Do they night not necessarily seeking out their personnel for defense, but night to night, do they pride themselves on defense? Do they have positional size across their lineup to execute their scheme? And have they sort of come into their own 
as a defensive unit. And that's where teams like Orlando and Oklahoma City, that's where they uh, thrive because they, you know, they had that identity very early on. And with Chet playing all 82 and OKC and being such this, this new unique weapon, and with Jonathan Isaac coming back healthy for Orlando, you know, that's they built themselves into those sort of identifiable teams. And so I think coaching has a lot to do with it. I think night to night effort. I think youth, you can't be too young, but you need to be young enough to uh, not miss a lot of games, you know, or at least be able to have a couple people come out of the lineup and not have everything sort of fall apart. But I think all that stuff matters. And like, I'm not trying to pay it short shrift. Defense will really matter. It will go a long way in determining which teams make the playoffs and which ones don't. But yeah, there's always stuff to learn from our rankings. I have not gone back and listened. I know you said before the pod that you did revisit it a little bit, but I, I'm sure <laughs> it was it was eye opening eye opening uh, on both for both of us. May I also add that I've realized when you're doing this, you should, it's kind of like you should ask yourself like how good do I think this team's going to be next year? Because like, you know, you have to make the math work, right? You have to say like, okay, if I think they're going to be a championship contender, they probably have to have a top 10 defense then, right? Like if you think this team's going to compete for a title, unless you think they're going to have the greatest offense of all time, right? they probably need a top 10 defense. If you think they're going to be average and you think they're going to have an elite offense, you probably think they're going to have like a poor defense because if they had an elite offense and elite defense, they wouldn't be an average basketball team. So it's just also asking yourself, like, make sure the math maths when you're doing this, I guess, is what I'm saying. Of course. No, that that is exactly right. I, I try to think of it. I try to think of it from the other end where I, I try to really think about how good their defense is going to be. And then when I look at my rankings with offense and defense, I go, huh, like maybe I'm too low on this team or maybe I'm too high on this mm-hmm. team because it doesn't quite – work out in the rankings. At least that's where I, I want to be able to get to where you can look at both sides of the ball in a vacuum and really feel like you've got something. But uh, here, man, without further ado, uh, did you tier your teams out or do you just have a one to 30 ranking? I have a very uh, loose tiers, but I do have my one to 30 ranking. I have, I have okay. loose, loosey so goosey tiers. Then you go with your, with your loosey goosey tier one. Or I'll say this, last year what ended up happening was the Minnesota Mm -hmm. Timberwolves were the number one defense in the league, and they were basically in their own tier. Mm -hmm. Per 100 possessions, they allowed what I have on NBA.com, a 108.4, which was two full points plus better than the number two defense, which was the Boston Celtics. And for comparison's sake, if you go that margin and apply it from the Celtics on down, the gap between the Wolves and the Celtics was the same as the gap between the Celtics and the number nine team, which was the New York Knicks. So that really is dominance from Minnesota. So who is your number one? And do you see them being in a similar kind of tier of their own we, or not? So wait, much? we're going, we're going to start with one. Oh, you want to start gonna... with 30? No, I want to start with one. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about like, I don't want to talk about like the the whiz oh, being a... really bad. Okay, well I have two. I think I have two teams in my my top tier. Um, eh, I'll put three. We'll go with three. Okay. Even though okay. I think that there's two that are better, at least this season will be. Again, we're doing regular season defensive ratings. I think for the people at home to remember this. So one to two, I think are interchangeable. Right now, I'm going to say that the Oklahoma City Thunder will have the best defense in the NBA okay. um, this season, but I would not be surprised if the Orlando Magic did. That's okay. going to be one and two. And then at three, I'm I'm going to leave them in this tier just because of what they did last year. I think Julius Randle is going to hurt them. I also think they're going to be playing a little bit more small ball lineups with you know Conley, DiVincenzo, and Anthony Edwards, Jane McDaniels. Um, and I just, I mean, I think it's hard. It's really hard to have the number one defense in the league back to back years in a row. Even if you look at like historically great defensive dynasties, they don't, they don't usually go back to back one, but, uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves at three right now. Okay. So Thunder one, Magic two, Wolves 
three. Mm -hmm. Again, by contrast, Wolves were number one, the Celtics were two, the Magic were three, and the Thunder were four last year. So uh, tell me why you think Oklahoma City is going to have the very, very best. Well, I mean, they already had this, like, incredible defense, right? Um, but I think they they added more rebounding. The biggest problem last year is they were they're getting beat on the glass a lot, so they weren't capitalizing possessions, which hurts your rating, your offensive rating, because the interesting thing about offensive rating, the way it's calculated, a new possession doesn't start until the other team gets the defensive rebound. So, like, a team like the New York Knicks, they always have a high – um, offensive rating not because they're like a super efficient offense but because they get a lot of offensive rebounds mm -hmm. so the possession never changes hands so basically even if they take three shots in one possession it's just like they're getting three times as many chances to be efficient on that possession as the regular team with the offensive rebound good so point. yeah the thunder address that so now you have somebody to you know punctuate defensive stops for you in Isaiah hardenstein and then they added the best perimeter defensive player on the planet. I understand he's on the wrong side of 30, but I, I think Alex Caruso is still incredible. Um, Kaysen Wallace is getting better. Aaron Wiggins getting better. They just have a really, really nice roster. They can do play a lot of different ways, um, do a lot of different things. Interesting. You think Caruso is the best perimeter defender in the NBA? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I know, like, you know, the uh, – the NBA hipsters, then you know, they want to talk about a little Jalen Suggs, a little bit of Derek White. Um, sometimes they get weird and start talking about Jonathan Isaac, but I mean, Alex Cruz was still that guy, man, for me. Really? So you he's been your guy for like multiple years then. You've been oh, on yeah, this he's probably been the best. Like. He's been the best perimeter defender in the league to me at least three or four years now. For sure, since he's been in Chicago, he's been the best perimeter defender in the league. Wow. See, I like how you phrased it like uh, NBA hipsters might be talking about someone else as mm -hmm. if Alex Caruso is not like the NBA. He's like the unless, guy. He's like the nerds are building statues of Alex Caruso, mm -hmm. not just in Oklahoma City, but like in every city across the country. Someone's building an effigy to him somewhere. I, I think that he is up there. Certainly. I think he is awesome. I, if you're asking me out of his type who the best defender is i would say it's Derek white he would be my pick but i can understand the pick of caruso but like what's interesting about him is that he's not he can he guards up of course mm. but he's not um like a like a true wings wing like he is a guard so you think that he's a better defender than like og ananobi or Jalen McDaniel or Jaden McDaniels, excuse me, or something, something like that. You think he's better than guys who are bigger than him on the positional spectrum? Mm -hmm. OG's tough because he's just such a Swiss Army knife. Um, I think he's better than Jaden. I think Jaden struggles a little with physicality and get his hand caught in the cookie jar sometimes a little too much. But OG's interesting because he kind of can do a little bit of everything. He's got the off ball nail defender can um can play at the point of attack obviously the weak side rim protections the thing of legend yeah i still i don't know caruso's communication like just the defensive imprint he leaves on every game like the impact metrics love him like he just makes like the bulls were like we're going to talk about the bulls i thought we were they were going to be the first team we talked about but just not in the way i thought we were going to talk about it but he like he made them like a serviceable defense. This terrible, terrible ass basketball team. I know serviceable because of him. The communication, just like the he's like the coach's dream. He always knows where to be. He like the way us nerds like were taught, like learned about the game is like we see it all in Caruso. Like the way he communicates. I know um, he's like us. Oh, yeah, he know. is like he's one of us. One of us. Right. One of us. But um, right. yeah. Yeah, I I don't have anything to argue with as far as mm. that sort of thing goes. I watched a lot of Bulls last year for some reason, but and they played a lot of close games and they won a lot of close games. They really were an odd team, but I Caruso's effect on them was incredible. You know, by far the best season of his career. I will say that I have I have the same order that the teams finished in last year. I have Minnesota one, Boston two, Orlando three, Oklahoma City four. Um, that sounds like I'm sliding Oklahoma City or something. I'm really not. 
It's more that they were exceptionally healthy last year. Mm -hmm. And I think they will still probably be pretty healthy because no one on that team is really worn down. But I think they'll like someone will get a little bit more nicked up. I, I don't think Chet, for example, is going to play all 82 games. And uh, do you have any like what sort of scheme if those two bigs are sharing the floor, Hartenstein and, and Chet? How do you think they are defending the pick and roll, for example? And where do you think Chet sets up? And where do you think Hartenstein sets up? I think it's going to be a lot of switching, honestly, because the reason most teams don't want their big switching is not because they don't trust their big man on the perimeter. It's more that they're worried about the mismatch you get on the inside, where if you switch, right, that means, you, you know, say you switch a big man, say you switched Isaiah Hardenstein on to Anthony Edwards. That means that, you know, we'll say – Lou Dort, which is kind of, I guess, the bad example because Lou Dort. Yeah, because it's Gobert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like I say, so Lou Dort, Lou Dort switched on to, we'll say Julius Randle, right? Like that's yeah. like a mismatch down low. So like when Anthony Edwards takes his pull up three, um, I'm sure Isaiah Hardenstein will figure out a way to contest it in a reasonable way. But the thing is, you're not only are you giving up a, you know, pull up three, but you also are offering the Minnesota Timberwolves a chance at an offensive rebound. And we talked about why offensive rebounds can be detrimental. But when you have that double big alignment, it's okay to do that because you're going to have that second big in the paint. You see this a lot. I saw this a lot with Cleveland. They would have um, Allen and Mobley kind of, they would let them switch on the perimeter because they knew the other one was on the Uh back line Uh to still take care of rebounding duties. So I'd say you could switch a lot. Um, I mean, you can still do drop coverage if you want to keep them them in the paint. It'll, I would agree it'll be, that it'll I, be interesting. I think their goal should be to enable a bunch of switches because I think you know, with a few exceptions, that that should be the goal of most modern defenses. Especially that's what you see in the playoffs: is the teams that advance are the ones who at least have the personnel to switch a lot of the time because that's how you try to slow down really really great offenses is mm. to be able to switch and do it really really well um i don't have really like I, said, I don't have a very strong argument against the thunder especially if you know caruso jalen i think jalen williams i love jalen i know you love jalen williams but uh, he you know to a very fault. to yeah. a fault very underrated defender and is you know really entering his physical prime uh they're gonna be really great i just i have minnesota number one because it's pretty incredible to me that they were as good as they were while still navigating the cat go bear tandem and to your point about not feeling too bad about leaving a big out on the perimeter too much you know that that's the ultimate example of you know, Gobert likes to play and drop. That's where he is at his most comfortable. And that means that Cat was out on the perimeter a fair amount and it didn't really hurt them because of their collective length, their ability to switch lots of other actions and the relative inability of teams to, or I guess the unwillingness of teams to just try to isolate Cat in space and say, this is what our offensive possession is going to be. You know, teams, especially in the regular season, don't like to to you know go into iso ball like that all of the time i mean they have to try to take advantage and put cat in screens and try to get around but like all of that is to say the wolves are still number one in the league despite that sort of seeming clunky fit and now with randall in place of uh towns i I don't think that he's, you know, going to be skittering around screens anytime soon. But in terms of playing with physicality, getting into foul trouble less, uh, and still being this great rebounder, I think they are going to be able to punctuate their defensive possessions, like you said. And I just think Edwards and McDaniels, as a wing tandem, is pretty special. And Gobert, as a backline protector who knows exactly what he's doing and who's still a deterrent no matter what anyone else tells you, the, like I think that infrastructure, those bones are really, really, really strong. Um, I'm worried a little bit, I guess, about Robert Dillingham playing. I mean, Dillingham's going to be fun, but he's not ready to be a good NBA defender mm-hmm. like remotely. He may never be ready to be a good NBA defender, but I, I ultimately don't think he's going to play that much for this team because I think they are going to be that good. Um, 
And even though they lost, I guess, Kyle Anderson, and he was someone off the bench who could come in and be sound defensively, be a good communicator, you know, replacing him with Joe Ingles is a obviously a meaningful step down. I just think that between uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, you know, DiVincenzo, who isn't a great defender, but he's not terrible, Conley Edwards, McDaniels, you know, there's enough perimeter talent on the wing. And then the bigs, Reed, Randall, Gobert, can both deter and rebound really, really well. So that that's why they're my top team. Do you see anything in particular with them that gives, like, you're more enthusiastic about the Thunder, but do you see anything that you're actually concerned about with Minnesota or no? I think, again, it's just like, so it's, do you, you play fantasy football at all? Sure. Okay, you do. So, like, it's like, you know how the thing is saying is like the the guy who finished number one in fantasy football points the year before, like he, he usually never repeats. It's like a curse. Like look what happened with like Christian McCaffrey, right? It's kind of it's kind of like that is what I'm trying to go through with this exercise. I'm like, I, you know, on paper, I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't the Timberwolves repeat as the number one defense? And then it's like, I think I'm trying to figure out because it's just improbable. It's very improbable to have a team repeat, right? And so I'm trying to think of ways where it would go wrong or not go wrong because – um. There is like situations where, for example, maybe Minnesota this year is like, okay, we know that we have this formula in our back pocket, you know, great defense, average offense. This is how far we can get. Why don't we, and I'm going to talk about this later on with a team that's, you know, very popular in a lot of uh, dialogue around the NBA who doesn't have a very strong defense, but maybe we're going to experiment a little bit this year. Let's sacrifice some defense and, go for more offense and see if it increases our overall net rating. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, I'll cite the example later on where you see this, but like now that you have DiVincenzo, it's like, why don't we play more lineups? So it's like Conley, DiVincenzo, Edwards, get more shooting, more spacing, more on ball creation on the floor. We sacrifice mm -hmm. a little bit of defense, but maybe the, the math works in our favor. We get a little bit better. And so like for me personally, when I'm again, it goes back to that overall thinking where it's like, I don't think the Timberwolves are any better than they were last year. I think they're probably right around the same team, but I think they're going to get a little bit better on offense. So if they got a little bit better on offense and were still the number one defense, they would be better. So that's kind of like me bouncing it on. Like, okay, maybe they just get a little bit worse on defense. And that's why, that's how you get to that outcome. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think mm. a, a a slightly different point, but a related one is mm. if, your, if your offense is actually always going to be lagging behind a little bit, and this is the point I'm making that about- hurts the defense the magic it hurts the defense because you don't want to be put in transition all of the time you know and the magic in addition to that issue they also uh foul a lot i mean they fouled mm -hmm. a lot last year and it's still you know, they still turned in a fantastic defensive season they are also always going to play like always going to play with a true five on the floor between wendell carter you know mo wagner uh goga uh, batadze so their structure is always going to be tilted towards positional size. You know, Franz and Paolo and one of those guys is just like a huge three, four, five. Isaac is an ultimate weapon. You know, he'll play some center for them as well, or he could play the four. Like just lots of very, very large people uh, matching up on defense. And for the most part, being able to stay in front. And uh, Suggs and Contavious, you know, Suggs was all defense last year. Contavious is a pro, you know, a real pro coming in from Denver. So they're going to be very good as well. I just, turnovers and fouls will, I think, do just enough to knock them out of the top. And with the Celtics, it's, you know, Porzingis is hurt and Horford's a year older. But I ultimately... Well, you know, I want to talk to you about the Celtics. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me. I actually, I have the Celtics at... I have them. This is bad podcasting. I have them at seven. Okay. Yeah, that's a they're one of my bigger drop offs. Um. So, I think one thing I've been trying to sit with a lot this off season is, you know, I remember two years ago, the Golden State Warriors after they won the NBA title, we're talking about the two timelines. We're like this team's unbeatable. They're so ahead of the game, like their movement, their motion, the split actions. Like no, it'll take years for any team to catch up to them. It took like three months. Took like three months and they get eliminated in the second round, right? 
Then the Denver Nuggets, I'm like, oh, they got Jokic. He's the best player in the world. This five-man lineup, the synergy, the balance, the the amount of physicality, on-ball creation, spacing. I've never seen anything like it before. The Minnesota Timberwolves eliminated them in seven um, in the second round. I know they were a perfect matchup for them, but still, like, they looked very human, very beatable. And I'm like, the NBA, like, you can't just bank on continuity anymore. You can't. You always have to make, like, a move. Like, that's why, like, the Knicks kind of had a super aggressive offseason. They're like, just because we were kind of close with this roster, like, it's not enough. Um, So, with the Celtics, they bring back the same core, but – and it, you know, on paper it looks good, but like it felt that way for the Nuggets, felt that way for the Warriors. So me personally, I'm trying to sit there. I'm like, okay, you, you know, if you're going to learn your lesson as an analyst, you've got to start thinking about things that could potentially go wrong, ways the ship could sink. Mm-hmm. And I look at the center position, right? And I think Kristaps Porzingis is going to miss the first couple months of the season. This guy is no stranger to injuries. What if you know he just knock on wood it doesn't happen you know i really like the guy as a player i think he's a very impactful player very underrated but like what if he just doesn't get healthy you telling me you're gonna rely on al horford who you know has been a saint for the last 20 years in the nba you think you can rely on him though for a full 82 game season at age 39 he's gonna be 40 by the time june hits say al horford starts to break down what's next luke cornett xavier Xavier tillman Tillman. like yeah yeah, you know like I, i love me some xavier tillman i think the guy's got some of the best legs i've ever seen but like if you're if you're a championship level team, like that's not your starting center. That's not a guy who's playing 20 minutes for you a night. So, and then this is the center position we're talking about here. Like, I don't think the offense is gonna get hurt too bad if Chris Stops and Al Horford are missing time because they're not really the guys who um butter the bread, but the defense, it's gonna it could fall a little bit. And plus, then you have to think about they've won it now. They have they've won it. I know Missoula is a really intense guy. I know he watches the town like four times a week, but yeah. they're, they're going to slow down a little bit in the intensity. I feel like they're not going to have their foot on the gas pedal as much as they have in the past regular seasons. So it's kind of where I'm at with them. Yeah, I think it's fair to try to budget something in. Mm-hmm. and But to me, the injury point is much more relevant than the, like, the intensity point. Because mm-hmm. whether you – I mean, for all of Missoula's uh, – quirks i'll call them quirks they're quirks we can call them quirks what they will what they do prioritize as an organization is uh sort of like expected value in the shots that they give up so i don't think that's going away anytime soon i I think they will know exactly who they want shooting on the other team going into a given game where they want those shots to come from uh, everyone will be on the same page, certainly. I mean, continuity does count for something. And in White, Holiday, Brown, and Tatum, in terms of just sort of night-to-night reliability, communication, switchability, uh, and the ability to sort of make drives uncomfortable for the opposing team, I mean, that foursome is probably the best in the league depending on where your mileage varies for what OKC or Minnesota can trot out. But I would take just those four for Boston over anybody else. So I, I understand how maybe they could dip a little bit, but I will sort of, I'll let them show that to me because I have too much faith in what they've got. Um, So we've talked about, looks like Minnesota, Boston, Orlando, OKC is my order. OKC, Orlando, Minnesota is your top three. Boston's at seven. Who uh, is numbers four, five, and six for you? Yeah. Um, so I got some familiar faces from mm-hmm. last year. So last year, just for some reference, it was OKC, Miami, and Cleveland at the four, five, six. For me, at my four, five, six, I have the Memphis Grizzlies, the Miami Heat, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Okay. I have the Cavs at five, because remember mm-hmm. I had the Celtics mm-hmm. at two. Cavs at five, I have the Knicks at six. So we'll talk about you Can said you just the, give me your seven first. Seven's fun. I have the San Antonio Spurs oh. at number seven. But okay. I will uh let's talk about Memphis because Memphis is now we're getting into draft waters because they're starting a rookie at center. So you tell mm-hmm. me why you think uh they could be that good with uh Edie in the middle with the rest of their personnel and how you see that defense shaking out. Well, so they were 12th last year, right? Without the ability to, you know, 
play any dead balls. Like they weren't making any shots. They were the 30th, what, 30th offense in the NBA last year. You know, that's not going to happen again. They have John Morant back. They have Desmond Baines healthy again. Um, You know, Gigi Jackson, unfortunately, has got that bone bruise. going to keep him back. But Vince Williams coming back. Uh, Marcus Smart. And I'm just naming names. But anyways, it goes back to that point I said earlier. It's like, okay, what do you think of this team? And I think this Memphis Grizzlies team, talent-wise, can hang with anybody in the NBA. I think they're going to be really good, right? I think they could, you know, push for 50-plus wins, win a playoff series or two. Um, if they get if they get Gigi Jackson back and actually be healthy, I think they could win a playoff series against anybody, to be honest. I think they have that much lineup versatility, that much talent. But I also don't think they're in elite offense. I think that, you know, the best version of them can be a fringe top 10 offense. So so I'm asking myself, well, I'm like, I think they're so good. Like, why do I think they're so good? It's because of their defense. I think with Jaron Jackson, who's just two years removed from being a defense player, you're having a big body like Edie that gives you lineup versatility, helps you play against certain matchups. You have Brandon Clark, who's back and healthy, who looked good at the end of the season when he played. Marcus Smart is, you know, he's older, but his defensive impact metrics still look awesome when he was playing. Um, you have all of these, like, long wings who can offer secondary rim protection in Santi Aldama and Vince Williams and Gigi Jackson when he's healthy. And then you got this Jalen Wells guy, Jalen Wells guy, who I've, I've not really seen play, but, of course, the Memphis Grizzlies did a good job drafting him, and I think I saw you talking about him Am I missing? There's one more key name, I feel like. But the point is, like, this is a, you know, this is a team that's historically, when they're healthy, they're really good defense. I think they have a lot of good defensive pieces, a lot yeah. of different defensive pieces that could do a lot of different things. Oh, they have Scotty Pippen Jr. too. Don't forget about that. And John Conchar is another guy. There you go, Conchar. Yeah. So many, like, bodies, so much, like, secondary rim protection that they can get. And, you know, rim protection, as we saw with getting rim protection from other positions – Something the Dallas Mavericks did a really good job of last year it goes a really long way on the defense side of the ball. Yeah, they are a big, I think I mentioned earlier that, mm-hmm. you know, how you are coached and what your identity is really, really matters. And the Grizzlies are always well coached and always care a lot, a lot about their defense. And the key here is putting Jaron Jackson Jr. in his best position to like wreak havoc to use a cliche on defense because two years ago he was the defensive player of the year and Steven Adams was there to be the primary sort of rim deterrent just as a big body secure all those rebounds and allow him to operate a ton on the weak side and come in and alter shots you know at the last second or deter drives just by sort of the threat of his presence and on the weak side now Edie who I love, uh, he is, you know, it's a lot to ask of a rookie to fit into a defense this good and fulfill a role as important as the center position. It's not unheard of because, you know, Chet did it last year and the Thunder were really, really good, but Chet's also a much different defensive talent than Mm -hmm. Edie is because of his, like, incredible mobility and timing on his blocks. He was always this great defensive prospect. Uh, as a youth player, uh, with Zach, I think it's going to, I am discounting the Grizz a little bit because they're breaking Edie in is going to take a little bit of time just in executing their coverages, getting the terminology down, understanding and reacting to the speed of the game and what his assignments are. I just think there's a natural transition period there. Um, I think they could be really rolling perhaps by the end of the season, but I do think that the beginning of the season, there's going to be little hiccups here and there. But all of your other points, I agree with. And I think that their uh, their depth is really, really good. Unfortunately, in Gigi's case, he's out. But I think that that will, like, Gigi, I don't think is ready to be a great NBA defender yet. Or really, I don't think he's necessarily ready to be a positive NBA defender yet. And I think mm-hmm. reallocating his minutes more to Brandon Clark is probably going to help their numbers. Uh, And you just hope that Marcus Smart still has it and has not begun to break down because if he does and he is not breaking down, then between Smart's communication and his perimeter ability and Jaron Jackson just being more comfortable, you know, that alone can get them, you know, sniffing the top five. So, uh, yeah, I feel good about them. I think I have them like eighth or ninth. But just a little bit of a discount because of the ED tax for getting him getting him up to snuff. Um, That's fair, but also you have to think about like Brandon Clark is kind of ED insurance. 
you know, if he's not ready. Glenn Clark's a little bit, I mean, a lot of it's smaller than Edie, but he's a little bit undersized for the center spot. But he can he could definitely play that five spot. And again, I just like the I don't know, there's just so many different ways they could skin that cat. Um where are you at with Ja as a defender these days? Not, no, I don't know. I have to, you know. Um I didn't really get to I actually don't think I watched a single John Morant game last year. In the six yeah. games he played, I didn't watch any of them, so I don't even know where he's at. It's, I mean, my last impressions of him, like kind of Tyrese Halliburton, you know, that's not meant as a compliment. No, um, I understand. I understand. But, um, and, and so, and that's and that, like, that's another thing. Like, to me, yeah. I look at the Ja ED 1 5 pairing and how that is something that they will need. Like, they'll need to figure that out. If he's getting picked off on screens all of the time by a big, and then you're going downhill at ED. Edie's going to have to be very good at sort of retreating if, if they're going to play him in that sort of scheme or if they're playing a deep drop, then that opposing guard is going to be in the lane, you know, a lot. And that means their nail help, which will be really good, is going to have to be really good. And just that's when I when I say that, like, the timing is just going to have to be down. It's just going to have to be ready to go. That's all. Um, but anyway, I've. Stated I'll that. say I will say um this is anecdotal and of course they're gonna you know they're gonna talk about their guy like that but I did get a chance to talk to a couple of Memphis scouts and they are very impressed with where Edie's at currently um again take that with grain of salt yeah dude I'm impressed with where Edie's at currently you know mm-hmm. Zach we, like I am all in on Zach and mm-hmm. like like just being large and rebounding that much and having a seven ten and a half wingspan. It will cover up for a lot. If I were really skeptical about Edie, I'd have the Grizzlies like 18th, and I don't. I have them like 8th. So, you know, we're really not that far apart at all. But mm-hmm. uh, we don't, um, what? We don't need to talk about the Cavaliers, right? Pretty self-explanatory. You got Mobley, Allen. You yeah. Know, they're they're going to keep doing their thing. So you, have them, you have them 6th. I have them 5th. But I actually have them in my first tier. My first really? tier is a tier of 5. And okay. so I would not be stunned if they had the number one defense at the end of the year. That's how highly I think of them. And it, again, there's that's health permitting. You know, last year, Allen missed a chunk of time, and I think Mobley missed a chunk of time. Mm-hmm. Like, and they didn't. Um, their net rating when they played together wasn't great. You might expect that to be the case because of the offensive clunk. But two years ago, I think when the Cavs were the number one defense in the league, their net rating was great because like no one could score on them, you know, relative to the rest of the league. And so I just think if they are healthy, they will be quite good. Uh, And their starting five is locked and loaded and they have a Coro off the bench. And if you know, Dean Wade is healthy, you know, hopefully he is, he's a nice defensive piece. Uh, But it's really just having, you know, Mobley and Allen are both so smart that having one of those guys on the floor for basically 48 minutes uh, will, you know, it just goes a long way. So yes, that in a nutshell, that's why I am as optimistic on them as I am, but yeah, we can keep going. So we've talked about your top seven, uh, who is, and I guess I had the Knicks sixth. So where do you have New York? Yeah, I had the Heat at six. Um, just going to keep riding that yeah, Spolster wave it. out yeah. as long as you can. I mean, he's always got a top defense with Bam. So I'm not going to not gonna expect that to change now. But I have the Knicks at 11. Um, my notes could see, for sure, could see them kind of in that sixth spot. I think when you have, you know, OG McHale, Hart, Deuce, and Tibbs. That's kind of like a great formula, especially mm-hmm. if they can get Mitch Robinson back and, you know, get some line of versatility going. I'm just like, just in general with this team, I'm worried about what like one injury would do to them at this point with their mm-hmm. depth concerns. And I'm kind of baking that in. I'm like, okay, it'll probably be like, and it goes back to like what I think of them as a team. I think they're like a, you know, mid fifties, high fifties win teams. And I think they've got an incredible offense. So I'd say, you know, maybe like they're the top three or four offense and then 10th, 11th best defense. That's usually a high 50 win team right there. Mid high 50 win team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't have a ton to add, except I guess 
OG and Mikhail, since OG is going to be playing a lot of four, hmm. there is a question about um, how much they're going to maintain that rebounding edge because with Randall at the four, Mitch at the five, uh, or Hartenstein at the five, or you know Hartenstein playing with Mitch in weird double big lineups last year, like that rebounding edge was so pronounced. Like they were probably the best rebounding team in the league the last couple of years under mm -hmm. Thibodeau. And so that is going to go away a little bit, which will knock them down, at least in that department. But do you uh, do you see OG and Mikhail being, you know, Mikhail was overtasked offensively in Brooklyn. His defensive reputation had started to wane a little bit, even in Phoenix, because you saw it like when he was matched up against Luka Doncic in the playoffs, you realize this guy is not, He's not really the stopper that maybe his reputation suggested that he was. So how in on that tandem are you as a as two guys night after night who are not only covering for Brunson, but who are like actively really turning other offenses away in the lane over and over again? Yeah, no, I really like it. Um, I mean, we've seen now that if you can like you can make up for i mean look at like the denver nuggets right with like michael porter jr contavious caldwell pope aaron gordon it's just like three guys really long um really on a string good secondary room protectors again we're gonna talk a lot about that secondary room protection and i think og on anobi mikhail hart and uh, josh hart is a better version of that defensively than those mm -hmm. three guys so there the formula works you know pat's not as good of a defender as Jokic. But the formula is there, like for having like a below average um, defensive center and still being pretty good on defense. With Mikhail, I think it is just a classic case of, you know, great role player got asked to do a role he's not usually he's not suited for. He picked up a couple of good skills while doing it, and now he can kind of go back to being like a superstar role player. Yeah, I. I mostly agree. Just wanted to have the conversation. And worth saying that Precious is going to get a lot of uh, yeah. run as well. And if nothing else, Precious will play really, really hard and rebound very, very hard. I would so, feel a lot more confident about this team if I could just guarantee that like Mitch Robinson's good to go for like 15, 20 minutes a night. Yeah, me too. But it will be a luxury to be able to bring him back slowly. You know, not mm -hmm. like as soon as he's cleared, he's playing 30 minutes a night, which is the Tibbs. You know, usual tips course. Uh, okay, with Miami um, and Bam being the centerpiece there, I think I had Miami like ninth or tenth, mm -hmm. which That's is cool. is more just like I you know, I just worry about how many games everyone on this team misses, really, except for Bam. And now I guess they are starting Rogier. And hero, which is a bummer to me, because I wish they could figure out some lineup where they didn't have to start hero. But if they're going to start Rogier and hero to make sure their three point volume is healthy, which I understand, like the math says, you need to get those threes up, and Jimmy's not going to do it, and Bam's not going to do it. Jovic does it a little, but you know he's sort of the fifth option out there. Then you need your one and your two to really get those threes up, and. I think that that just like it has to give something away if that's your one, two all of the time, you know, that coupled with Jimmy missing games, he's still a really effective defender in that system when he's healthy, made me think that something has to give here. Um, I like Khalil Ware a lot, but I don't know mm. that he's ready to be a really positive defensive piece that's you know a speed of the game adjustment rookie that you know he'll take his lumps but you see he, Windhorse calling him Derek Lively with a jumper I'm like let's slow down here buddy let's um, relax. I so I like Ware a lot and Ware was the best rookie in summer league that mm -hmm. I saw just playing in summer league for that week I thought he played I was the there best. with you yeah, of any rookie out there. Um, but no, I mean, Lively as a defensive prospect 
was much further along in like processing and reading the game. He also more mobile than where is, you know, is off the ground faster, even though where is a good at like very good athlete for his size. Lively's like elite. Lively's also taller, longer, you know, he's just a better physical talent. Um, but where's good. I mean, he is, I think that in Miami's search for offense and positional size, which they don't really have a ton of, uh, I would like to see Bam and Ware share the floor and see how that looks and see how if Bam's willingness to experiment with threes in the preseason transfers over to the regular season because where where will shoot threes? Not a ton of them, but he'll shoot them. And so I wonder if that alignment, um, even if Bam stays at five and Ware just goes into sort of the the weak side role, the weak side kind of eraser role, if that can give them some juice. But until I see that and I until I see that actually being put into practice, it's just like a lot of Jovic at the four and a lot of Jimmy missing games and a lot of Tyler Hero at the two. And that to me is sort of the inverse of the two, three, four, you know, of those good Denver defenses or of the Knicks defense this year. So it's just hard. So that's why I have them, I think, at nine. That's fair. I get that. Um, yeah, I get that. I think I, I think we're going to see a little bit more Butler this year. I think he's going to be hungry Butler um, with uh, the contract extension stuff going on there. See a little bit more of him. Like me, some Haywood Highsmith. There's Josh Richardson's going to be back. For all his, his faults as a player, still a very tenacious defender, can really get into guys. Um, Jame Haquez still there. Shout it's out not. to Josh Christopher, you know, summer league MVP. Oh yeah. Oh, Going to yeah, get a go. shot. I, I like he's undersized, but like everyone mm-hmm. in the heat system, very, very hungry. And I think a better defender than people understand right now. So I like him, but you know, we're talking about 10 minutes a night now. Um, okay. Uh, I had the Spurs at seven. Obviously, this is a, a Wembenyama bet about mm-hmm. how high he can lift that defense up. But not just that, you know, with Chris Paul and Tyus Jones, or pardon me, Trey Jones, at point, there's lots of fewer turnovers on offense, which means that, you know, they're not going to be in transition defense as much. Uh, it is asking a lot of Wemby to, like, I'm not saying that Wemby's still not going to make his mistakes on defense because he still does make his mistakes, but the physical presence is the physical presence and deterrence is deterrence. And so he is sort of the ultimate sledgehammer in that department. I mean, the defensive, I I don't know the, like the clips from his rookie year when he's really figuring everything out on the fly of guys, just not wanting to take a shot anywhere near him are incredible. And that's not to say he didn't get burned a couple of times, you know, Luca, scored 70 on the Spurs with Wemby on the floor. And I think Shen Goon had a huge game against him once when Houston played him. But over again, over the course, the full breadth of a regular season, I don't think that it's a case of the league adjusting to Wembenyama as a defensive piece. I think it's still Wembenyama sort of exerting his influence on opposing offenses and just being so much more of a defensive threat than other teams are used to seeing. If they see three teams during the week and then they get the Spurs, it's just an entirely different challenge. So I will also say that with since it looks like Steph Castle is going to play as a rookie, he's a really, really good defensive prospect. Really smart, very good communicator, very, very strong, will fit what they are doing a lot. Uh, and I am more, I think, optimistic on Sohan than most are. I still think he is going to play a lot. And he entered the league really, really young. You know, he got clowned on for the point guard thing last year. He was 21 years old last year. No, he was 20 years old last year. He's 21 years old now. So as he gets more experience under his belt and less is asked of him on offense, his defense, which is in, like a big part of what got him drafted in the top 10, I think will come out and just sort of his natural ability to rebound, be in the right spot, agitate, be physical, uh, you know, work the sort of refs a little bit. 
I think that'll all come together. And I think they will want to win. I don't really see them tanking because I don't think Wembenyama really wants to. And I think it's good enough to keep the defense in the top 10. So where do you have uh, San Antonio? I had him at 10. Um, I made a similar bet on Wemby as you. I think he's just that good. But I just don't I don't see enough outside of Wemby to really put them any higher than that. I think 10's asking a lot like for one guy to push a defense all that way. Especially like I don't imagine them playing in more than like 32, 35 minutes a night um, at most if they're really trying to push him. Again, like, you know, Castle, I I've only seen limited amounts of him. He's very good on ball defender. Uh, I think Sohan's like a good defender. I'm, I'm not convincing me great anymore, like all league caliber, just because there's so many great defensive forwards. Yes, I, don't think I, he's I that, agree. As much that. of a like a playmaker on defense um, as I'd hope for. But like outside of that, who is there? Like Harrison Barnes is like a big body, but he doesn't really do much. Uh, Harrison Vassell's got much. A, he's a person. That, yeah, yeah. Devin Vassell's got a way to go. I mean, Chris Paul, Trey Jones are going to get picked on. Um, Kellen Johnson's there. Like Zach Collins had a pretty pretty shitty defensive year. I know. Um, champ is it Champagne? Julian Champagne. Champagne. He's, Champagne, he's pretty solid, but like he's not like you know, it's just like it's not no in terms of personnel, there. there's only one there's one gem, obviously, mm. a gem of gems. But mm. I think that Sohan is the other to me clear positive defensive mm-hmm. player. Uh I he's not all league and never will be all league, but he's a clear positive. And then it's just sort of everyone just kind of being in the right spot. You know, Vassell has a lot of defensive talent and had quite a oh, yeah. reputation. He's, he's not a huge wingspan. He's like 7'1 seven, seven, wingspan or some 6'11". 7'7 seven, seven to 7'1". Seven, he's yeah. right around there. Yeah, I mean, he had a crazy. great reputation coming in. He's just got to mm-hmm. be healthy. You know, he's got to be healthy. And I think he's focused more on his offensive game because the team will ask more of him offensively. You know, he, he probably will have the second – largest usage on the team mm-hmm. behind Victor. So uh but I just, you know, we we agree on the similar theory. I just mm. rank it a bit more aggressively. Yeah. Yeah. And then I uh, so what are your if you said who's your I think we talked about your number seven that we'd covered them. What was seven through ten for you? Yeah. Seven was the Celtics. Yeah. Eight was the Dallas Mavericks. Okay. Nine, the Houston Rockets, who also finished ninth last year, and then ten, the San Antonio Spurs, and then eleven, I had the Knicks. Okay. Yeah, I had the Spurs seventh, the Grizzlies eighth, the Rockets ninth, the Heat tenth, and then the Lakers eleventh, and the Sixers twelfth. So, uh, I guess Did we just disag- uh the, the Lakers. Oh, Lakers. you have the Lakers. Oh no, Heat tenth, Lakers eleventh, okay. Sixers twelfth. Sorry. Okay. Um, where do you have the Mavericks? Thirteenth. Interesting. 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 Should we talk about them first? Sure. Go well, for it. I, I mean, mean the, so, our our disagreement is going to be over Clay Thompson. I can tell you, but go ahead. Go ahead. So with the Mavericks, um, they were six last year after the the Gafford PJ Washington trade. There wasn't any real shooting luck going on. Um, had a good postseason defense right and what did they do they subbed out tim hardaway jr for um quentin grimes who i still think has a lot of juice just coming off a down year it was ultimate buy low and they sub out Derek jones jr for Najee marshall similar cal- call it a wash sub out tim hardaway jr for clay i mean josh green for clay thompson i don't think clay thompson's like a good defender anymore, but he he's a situational defender. You could use him against bigger bodies, like a Jason Tatum type. He could use his strength, really get into guys, be physical still. Um, so I just I don't know. I just see them being like a pretty similar defense to last year, second half of the season. They have so many different the thing that I like about the Dallas Mavericks is like the theory of their team gives them a lot of margin for error, right? So you know, Luca Kyrie, you could always trust him, put him in pen, right? And then you just need one of Gaffer or Lively to be on that day, and then two out of P.J. Washington, Clay Thompson, Quentin Grimes, and Najee Marshall to be on that day, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you just need two of them to be good that day. And I just, like, I like that. I like those odds. I like, okay, one day it's Najee and P.J., one day it's Quentin and Clay, like, whatever, right? I like the the optionality they have, and that just leads me to, to think they'll be a – and I think they're a title contender, so – I think they'll have a top 10 defense, top 10 offense. Yeah. I mean, they also 
are very good at drawing fouls because of mm-hmm. Luca. So that's a lot of dead balls allows their defense to get set mm-hmm. up going back down the other end of the floor. Uh, it's, you know, Lively's progression as a second year player, you know, he like, he was a rookie and a young rookie at that. I think he turned 20 in March. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he was a puppy. Uh, they're going to be really, really good. It's just, I think they, when you say you only need two of their wing, their supplementary wing rotation to be on, I probably agree with that. I don't think the coaching staff is going to be as aggressive in subbing Clay out. I think they will want him to start and close games until he really forces them not to. And mm-hmm. I just think th- we maybe we get to that point by January or something like that. But I think that will rear its head because Luca, Kyrie, Clay on the court offensively is great. And I think that is what will lead the team to continue to try to make it work. But subbing Clay in for Derek Jones Jr., and that's how I think of it because that's where mm-hmm. I think the minutes distribution will be. Uh, you know, Derek Jones, including having sort of the the secondary rim protection that you keep bringing up is just like really effective in Xing out to shooters, closing on three point shooters to run them off the line or to get them to swing the ball and allowing the rest of the defense to reset. And Clay just can't do that. He's just not in a position where he can do that sort of ground coverage stuff at the level that he used to be able to. I agree. If you want to isolate him with a bigger body and have a bigger body drive into him, he can still do his job. But I don't think that's what they're going to be facing most of the time if Luca or Kyrie is getting picked off at point of attack all the time and they're going into rotation. So uh, still good. And I still think a contender in the West. I mean, I'm very I think I have their offense fourth. So I I think very highly of them. But that's where I think that clay piece is going to going to bring them back a bit. Um, Let's see. We talk about. The Houston Rockets, the Rockets. Had ninth. I, yeah, I think pretty similar team last year. Um, get a little bit better. Ime Udoka squeeze the orange a little bit more. Reed Shepard <laughs> will play more minutes, so that'll probably hurt them just a little bit. But I think they're just a really good defensive team. Uh, really, really good. Yeah. And I expect they can wear. I expect them to take an overall step forward because mm-hmm. I'm, you know, their offense was 20th last year. I have them, I think, around 15, you know, 14 or 15 this year, which is really meaningful if you got a good defense. And uh, in terms of having guys to to throw out there on the wing, you know, a man, he's another one who could be in that, you know, perimeter defender conversation. He's not sort of the, uh, orchestrator that Caruso mm-hmm. is, but no one's really the athlete that Amen is defensively on the wing. So uh, I can think of one. I can think of one guy. Uh, no, Amen's even more gifted than Asar in that yeah. department. In my, opinion. I was talking about Tamani Kamara, but yeah, keep going. <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> so uh, they, Dylan Brooks, Van Vliet is still a positive defender, even at his size, even at his age. Uh, Jabari. You know, they will toggle him between the four and the five. But Jabari, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent about Jabari, who I rank number one in his draft class and still love to death. But he had a real meaningful improvement last year. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as flashy. uh, Like he wasn't a first time all-star that usually garners a lot of attention. But his efficiency on offense shot all the way up. And again, as someone who entered the league young, and has now shown to be able to withstand the grind of it. I think he started 75 plus games both years, you know, as a a year one and a year two player. Usually if you can do that, then year three is where you see sort of the physical games where now you're not playing from behind all the time and you can assert yourself more physically getting sort of your man strength to arrive a little bit. I expect a lot out of him. And if Adams can play at all for them, and I think they want him to, if he can play as a backup five and do his Adam stuff of moving people out of the way and winning those rebounding battles all the time uh, and always being in position, you know, they could finish higher than this. There's a world where the Rockets are like the fifth ranked defense in the league. 
they they are a very very dangerous team who i would not you know when you get to draft that many high picks in a row and you keep betting on athleticism which seemingly they have done eventually those dividends pay off and you become really hard to play every night for everyone mm -hmm. so yeah i i love them and they are I the, could, the, the coaching philosophy is right there hand in glove with udoka so i could see i could see them having like an orlando magic type season this year where yeah. we just kind of like see them as like a borderline top 10 defense and they you know go out and be a powerhouse just so much athleticism so much um point of attack defense so much run protection i think well the one thing that'll hold them back is just um they're gonna still they're still trying to figure some stuff out. Like, you know, the Jalen Green, Sangoon, like who the young guys they really want to build around are. And I think that'll lead to them playing some funky lineups and that'll bleed a little bit of value here and there. But overall, I still think really good defense. I put them in that tier kind of with like the Heat, the Cavs, the um the Mavericks, the Celtics kind of all jumbled together there. The Spurs, even all but even though I think the Spurs are even a notch below these guys. Yeah, well, shout out to Tari Eason, who we have not mentioned yet. Oh, yeah, Tari Eason, ja Jay Sean Tate. They're just kind of sitting on the bench, like two guys. And, and Jeff like... Green, you know, who still, like, mm -hmm. knows what to do. Like, they have so many players. I just, again, I could go on a tangent about any individual Rocket. I won't. But they were the ninth or 10th ranked defense, and Tari was dealing with a stress, re stress reaction in his leg all of last year. And Amen was a rookie. You know, I may just say I officially am just picking them to finish sixth. They have too much talent. I'm gonna I'm gonna move them up to six and shift everyone else down. There okay. we go. There's there's some fire in minute 49 of this podcast. So uh all right, who do you have next? With I think we've gone through your top eleven. Is that right? Yeah, so next for eleven for me. Yeah, um, your eleven is the Lakers. Correct. I don't So you want to talk that. about them? Yeah, we, so Remember that huge illusion thing I had earlier about um, teams like deciding to shift philosophies to see if the math adds up better for them. The Lakers last year pretty much did that where beginning of the year, Darvin Ham's kind of running these funky lineups, a lot of defense first lineups, basically where he's running like it was like I remember one time it was against the Mavericks. They had like LeBron, Jared Vanderbilt, Rui Hachimura, um, Cam Reddish and Anthony Davis, just like all defense and then like LeBron ball. Anyways, uh, it was, let's see here, where are we at? Where do I even have the Lakers? Oh, wow, I have them all the way at 20th. So they're 20th right now. But um, Oh, mercy. So uh, before February 2nd, they were 21st in offensive rating, 15th in defensive rating, 20th in net rating, okay? After February 2nd, they decide, okay, we're going to start D'Lo, we're going to start Austin Reeves, we're going to start Rui, LeBron Davis, right? So more of an offensively slanted lineup. And they moved to third in offensive rating, 22nd in defensive rating, but 12th overall in net rating. So by trading offense for defense, they experienced an eight-point jump in net rating. Uh, it's not how it works for every team, but for the Lakers, they did because they did have a little bit better offensive personnel. I didn't know they my were thinking third is, with that starting five. Yeah, yeah. That and is. so my, my thing is I think they're going to keep riding that. They're going to keep riding that. Let's go offense for defense because nothing's really changed fundamentally in that roster. And I'm betting on the fact that Davis played 76 out of 82 games last year, and I'm just probably not going to happen it this year. Um, and he's basically the bo like bones of this defense. Even if they only get like 65 games out of him, that's probably enough to move him down to 20th. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I probably agree with you. And I, pro I, I put them – in like the late teens mm -hmm. on offense and mm -hmm. that was wrong too i wish i had researched that properly and seen that they were third with their starting five their offense will be better their defense will be worse and then um, yeah jj too who's just kind of you know naturally inclined to offense based on how his playing career went himself and what he said you know about mm -hmm. changing their shot geography and everything mm -hmm. and you know they're going to try to integrate connect and rely on him and he's very offensively tilted as a rookie. Uh, yeah. I mean, Gabe Vincent, hopefully being healthy, will help him a little bit. Vanderbilt, I think being more healthy will help them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I agree. 11th is probably probably the ceiling of what they could accomplish, but they're probably in the teens somewhere. I think you're probably right. Um, okay. Yeah. Who else is – who do you have, I guess, up until 15? So at 12 – Um. You might want to put at 11, 
now that I've convinced you. I got the Denver Nuggets at 12. Okay. At 13, I'm going Golden State Warriors. 14, 76ers, 15 bucks. Yeah, I have the Lakers at, or pardon me, the Lakers at 11, the Sixers at 12, the Mavs at 13, who we discussed. Warriors at 14, Nuggets 15, Bucks 16. So these are all the same teams. Basically. Yeah, I mean, the one I want to, so Bucks, I mean, Rivers comes in, they were 15th in defensive rating under him. So I just figured pretty much the same thing. Um, adjust a little bit for Lopez, Giannis, maybe some injuries, but also they have like a lot of young defensive first guys like uh, Bochamp and Andre Jackson Jr. I'm sure we'll get more minutes. 76ers. I, I, I wouldn't be so sure under Doc, but yeah, I mean, you, you, it'd be you nice. You, you'd be it'd nice. Be nice. Yeah, yeah. It'd be you, nice. You get, you get where I'm going with that. Um, Torian Prince is there now. Gary Trent Jr. gets a lot of steals. That might help. But um, I think we feel the same way about 76ers. If you guarantee me, you know, 75 Joel Embiid games, I probably have him in my top 10. If, but, if you count playoffs, sure, maybe he gets there. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, yeah. even when he's hurt, the thing is, when he was hurt, like hobbled around in that Knicks series, they, he still was like a monster on defense. So, like, as long as he's like he's physically able to be on the court, like they're going to be a top ten defense. I just don't see it happening all that often. And, and then and Drummond backs him up, and Drummond's not yeah. some defensive whiz. I'm like, I mean, his. Well, I mean, they, you know, you lose Batum, um, losing. I guess they chose to lose Covington, but they like, lost a lot of size of power forward. Yeah, relying a lot on Paul George. I don't know. I just see him kind of average, accounting yeah. for those injuries. I uh, Nuggets. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead on Denver. Sorry, I don't really. Sorry. I don't have much to add with Philly. Okay. Go ahead. The Nuggets you had at fifteen. You said. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Um. Why not higher? Um. Mostly just when I. It's just going through and comparing them to these other teams. Do I think they have better defensive personnel than the Mavericks? No. I, you agree because you're higher on the Mavericks than I am. Mm-hmm. I think if I compare them to the Sixers, uh, I like Embiid and Paul George. You know, on the front line more than I like Jokic taking Kentavious then off the floor and relying on, you know, Michael Porter Jr. to stay healthy with his back. And I think any injury to the Nuggets, then you're getting into straw other minutes and he's an interesting player, but he's not defensively tilted. You're potentially getting into Peyton Watson, who's a talented athlete and like a good defensive prospect, but is inconsistent enough to where I don't know the coaching staff really trusts him. You've got the Russ factor. You know, I, I might think Russ just, helps. You think he does? Yeah. Oh yeah, he, he's taking a like he's he's like reinvented himself as a point of attack defender. I think that's a huge step up over like a Reggie Jackson. Could be. You might be right. I mm. with them, I I feel like their their core just is a little rickety to me. Mm. Is how it feels, and I don't feel like they are built to really withstand much i think Jokic, weirdly with how much he plays gives them a decently high floor on defense just because Jokic always knows where to be and even though he's not like he's not going to guarantee them a top seven defense because he's not that level of talent he will prevent them from falling much lower than like 16th or 17th so i guess i've got them closer to the floor of their range Mm -hmm. i just um like who is the best defender on the team? Would you say Aaron Gordon? Yeah, I mean, he's a he's a, almost an all league defender at this point. Almost, but like, is he a better defender than Draymond? You know, no. And they still have Kuminga and Wiggins but on the wings. Kuminga sucks. You think he sucks as a defender? <laughs> yes. You think Russell Westbrook, who you just <laughs> mentioned, is having reinvented himself? You think Russ is a Kuminga. better defender than Jonathan Kuminga? You know what? Like for all of it is out of controlness, like notoriously out of control, notoriously irresponsible on the court. Russell Westbrook knows where to be. Okay, Kuminga, like like he does, like his he is. Listen, that's another guy. Let me sit on my soapbox for a second. Let me sit on it. Another guy, the hipsters, they get really excited when Kaminga plays well. Okay. Hipsters. But it's like he is so far behind as a rotator for where he should be at this age. Like he's been in the league for what? This is going on five years now? Four no, years? No, no. This is this will be his fourth season. Yeah, he's going this is his fourth year, right? 
And he's just like, it's like something he misses stuff sometimes. I'm like, what? How? Like you've been you 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 play with Draymond. You didn't ever ask him one time, like, hey, let's go, hey man, let's go watch some film. I'd love to learn a thing or two about the about the game from you, you know, man. You've had a little bit of success. What an impression of Kuminga. You know, the vocal delivery was really there. I uh, I don't know that. I think what they say about Kuminga is in a similar sort of, you know, patronizing. Because I think he talked about, or someone asked him if he was going to play power forward. And even Draymond was like, I mean, you got to really, like, think the game to be a power forward this day and age. Obviously, the implication. Be every position, though. That's, the, like, that's every position. Where are you going to put him where he doesn't need to think? The bench. He would be on the bench. No. Look, it is his defensive flashes, which is basically in ISO on an Mm. island, just showing his movement skills and staying with people, I think are still very, very good. I think that Wiggins is the better overall defender. But this is more just about Draymond still being Draymond, still being Mm. incredibly effective. And like... Year two of Trace Jackson Davis, he's already a really good rebounder. He is a decent enough shot blocker, but he's sort of a take myself out of position shot blocker. He really has to like leave his feet in order to contest a lot of shots because he's undersized, but he'll be a little bit better. Looney still a really good rebounder and can come in and give you stable defensive minutes. Um, I just like that depth a little bit more than what Denver's got. It's close though. I mean, I have them 14th and the Nuggets 15th. I mean, do you see a big gap between those two teams? I mean, I had, um, I had the Warriors 13th, Nuggets 12th. So basically it's basically the same gap you had just opposite direction. My thing is like, I agree with you. Like, you know, when Draymond came back from injury, I think they were eighth in defensive rating after he comes back, not injury, excuse me. Um, self-inflicted, self-inflicted wounds, but, um, (laughs) right. Yeah. After, I just he like the, choked, I like the, after he choked and slapped people. Yeah. yeah, Denver. I like Denver's size more. I think they have more size. They're bigger. I mean, think about Curry, Pajemski, Melton are going to be playing a lot of minutes. And, I, you know, healed. I think healed. Yeah, he, you know, I don't even want to think about that right now. But, like, <laughs> like Melton's like a plus defender, right, when he's healthy. Melton's a plus defender. Um, I think Pajemski, you know, very heady guy. Uh, he's probably like a good, good rebounder for his good rebounder. Position. Yeah, yeah, he's probably yeah. like a, I guess maybe you could say plus defender for his size, but not for the two guard position because you're not supposed to be his size the two guard position. And then Curry has he's taken a step back now. I mean, he had a really good run in the uh 2022 playoffs mm-hmm. when they win the title, but I think you know he slowed down, which is just obvious. At the age of 36, the offensive load he's had to carry so. Just like the Nuggets a little bit more because of that size. They have a little bit more athleticism, more functional athleticism. I don't think that like Kaminga's athleticism is functional. Um, it certainly has not been actualized. Mm-hmm. I think it's functional again in those sort of ISO kind of mm-hmm. moments, but it, it has not been actualized. I can really sense the frustration in your voice that Kuminga it, it gets me. Like I like last <laughs> year when he was going on that, that run where he had like six straight games of like 20 points. And everyone's like, oh, my God, like, this is like kind of like Zion. I'm like, you know, I don't think everyone was saying that your perception of who NBA hipsters are and your place within that galaxy is fascinating to me as this podcast. Goes are, you say, are you saying I'm a, I have delusions of grandeur? Because you wouldn't be the first person to tell me that. I, th- I think you have delusions of normalcy. I think you okay. very much are the hipster that you accuse everyone else yeah. of being. But I look, I think that. uh Kuminga, I think, is turning. I think he's an October birthday. Speaking of psychotic knowledge that I have, but I think he just turned twenty-two. He was nineteen year one, twenty year two, twenty-one year three. He will be twenty-two this year. I mean, if ever there were going to be a defensive step up from him, mm-hmm. you would think it would happen right around now. So if he if it he demonstrates the same frustrating sort of inconsistency, then you will be proven right. But you still have the Warriors, you know, right around the same place that I do. We mm-hmm. just, you know, we we view them from similar or from different uh, ends of the spectrum. I mm-hmm. say, yeah, I think that team is going to be pretty good. And you're like, ah, see Jonathan Kaminga. I will say this. If he is 10% better than you think he's going to be, do you think they can have a top 10 defense just because of Draymond and everything Kuminga. else? I just thought, like, I said, okay, so if I thought, like, if I was 100% sure I could trust Draymond to, like, you know, just to have a regular season be himself, 
Um, like I would have him in the top 10 because they were literally a top 10 defense when he was healthy last year. Right. So I don't know with him. Cause even if you like look back at his like past seasons, like it's, he's only had one season where he played over 2000 minutes, I think in the last like four years or five years, which is what they're going to need him to do if mm. he's to, um, if they're to have a top 10 defense. So I just don't, and there's just so many like good defensive teams. Like, am I going to, am I going to say I trust the Warriors more than I do the Houston Rockets? No. No, and neither do I. But that's the thing mm-hmm. is that like, and we're getting to like the middle of the pack right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these and, are all like, you know, you could tell me the Nuggets are 11 or the, the 76ers are 11. Like I'd be okay. You know, I get Right. It, and that's the, and the thing about that is I, I think the final ranking depends a lot on health. And that is maybe where the Nuggets get a leg up just because like I said, like Jokic mm-hmm. plays, Aaron Gordon plays. Porter Jr. like has stayed healthy somehow the last couple regular seasons, but they do lose Contavious and Jamal's nicked up again. So we'll see how that all shakes itself out. Um, all right, we will we won't spend as much time on the back half here, but you mentioned the Bucks. I have the Clippers next, I think at 17th, technically. Um I, you know. I am a pretty vocal Doc Rivers skeptic, but even this thing with the Bucks, because you would, you know, think a lot of folks would say, oh, isn't Giannis, you know, an all defense player? Isn't Brooke Lopez in the DPOY conversation every year? You know, how do they not have a top 10 defense? Uh, this is more just on how the team has been constructed and how much they're going to rely mm-hmm. on Trent and DeLon Wright and Torian Prince. Not that those guys are bad. I just think they're going to overtax them because those guys are going to be responsible a lot for covering for Damian Lillard, who's 34 years old and has never been a good defender. And I just don't think that any one of them really possess any standout trait to help do that. So, and I don't think Doc, when he he's actually push comes to shove, I don't think he's going to play young players much at all. So... It's going to be a lot of those guys. I don't know if Connaughton is still there. He might still be there. He is there. He, he's there, but, you know, he's and, only so you know, much of them left. And a lot of Portis. You know, I just, I, it's, it, it bums me out because I think that you, we still could have a really great Giannis season, but I think mm-hmm. that he will be swimming upstream on that team. So, yeah. Or, and then the, he's not the best health bet anymore anyway to say nothing of Dame or anything else. So that's where I've got them, where I've got them. Um, where do you have the Clippers? Do you have them, like, in the next few? Um, here, I'll just read you mine. Go ahead. Let me say this one thing quickly about the Bucs. Uh, it goes back to, like, overall my view on the team. I think that, you know, they have elite spacing, elite offensive personnel, probably, like, a top five, six offense. But I don't see them as, like, a title contender, intercycle title contender. So that's where I kind of leave them in that like 15, 20 range. Cause if I did see them as a title contender, I'd probably say they're pushing the top 10. Uh, so yeah, 16 through 20, I'll read you. Cause the Lakers are 20. So 16 was the Sacramento Kings, 17, the Atlanta Hawks, 18, the Phoenix Suns, 19, the Los Angeles Clippers, and then 20, the Lakers. Okay. The, did you just say the Kings at 16? Oh yeah. No, I'm go I think off I'm, baby. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they finished 14th last year, and they had the worst shooting luck in the NBA. The assumption is that doesn't happen again. I think they, you know, that regresses the mean. And so you're like, okay, why would they go down um, then in defensive rating? You lose J- Jordy Fernandez. You're subbing in Harrison Barnes minutes for DeMar DeRozan. And while Harrison Barnes doesn't do anything, DeMar DeRozan does, like, negative things on defense. So you lose that. But I really like – I I love – the duo of Keegan Murray and Keon Ellis on defense. Last year, in the last 15 games of the season, when Keon Ellis moved to starting lineup for good, the Sacramento Kings are the third best defense in the league. And it was pretty much just on the backs of Mike Brown's intensity for the defense. Um, they're rebounding. They're a really good defensive rebounding team. So they capitalize possessions. They finish possessions. And then Keon Ellis, Keegan Murray has a defensive tandem. Just really superb. They're both really young. You can bank on that. Um growing this season so i just like them as an average even it goes back to me saying like i think the kings are kind of team that could challenge for a top six seed in the west if they're going to do that and i don't think they have the best offense in the nba so if they're going to do that they're going to be like a six seven offense in a middle of the pack defense kind of like the bucks okay 
Okay. I'll, uh, I mean, I like Keon and I mm -hmm. like Keegan. I don't know that they can really carry the water. I mean, oh, you, I think they can. I think they have the juice for it, man. You do? Yeah. Okay. I mean, neither one of them. You won't is... hear that on hipster Twitter. <laughs> neither one of them. And in, in, in terms of NBA physicality and NBA mm -hmm. athleticism, I don't think either one of them are like overwhelming physical talents. I think they're good NBA athletes, both of them, like solidly good starter level NBA athletes. But I just think you need a little bit more than that if you're going to be aiming because middle of the pack is like a real accomplishment. Teams win the mm -hmm. title with middle of the pack defenses, depending on how good their offense is. But I don't I don't quite think that with Sabonis and DeMar on the court all the time. Those guys don't miss any time. You have, to also, you have to think but, Fox has become the best um, high usage defensive point guard in the NBA. Uh, he was last year, at least. High know, usage. High usage. So, like, Drew Holiday does not have high usage is what you're No, doing. not anymore. Right. No. Yeah. So, I, Shea's really the only other contender, and I, I'm not that bullish on Shea's defense. I think Fox is, like, again, he's, I would say, solid I think I have the Kings at 20th. That's about where I okay. think they will, they will. Okay. Win. So I don't hate them, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know when Sabonis, there are very few players who by playing all the time as a big, I think guarantee you a, like a low, low ceiling. And I think Sabonis is one of them still rebounds the hell out of the ball, but man, like the scout, this, the scouting notebook on Sabonis is pretty clear. And I don't really see that changing that much, but it'd be fun. Like if Keegan and Keon are as good as you say, and they really start to elevate the Kings, the Kings, I will love watching the Kings. They might be my favorite team to watch if they can get some defensive juice out of those two, but we'll see. I mean, I guess the way to approach this now is, and the Kings are a good entry point into it is like, there are lots of teams out West who fancy themselves competitive and who want to make mm -hmm. the playoffs teams like the Suns or the Pelicans, you know, and we haven't really talked about them yet. So how, and I guess out East, you know, the Pacers. So how low do you have all of those respective teams? And my apologies if you mentioned any of them in your. Yeah. So I had the Suns at 18. Okay. Okay. I just say a quick thought on the Hawks. Yeah. They got better. They got better. I agree. Um, I, I like agree. Daniels. I like Reese Shea. I like Jalen Johnson. Um, yeah, I have them at 18th as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to make, you know, we got that. I think they're going to be a top eight playoff seed this year. But Suns, yeah, I have them at 18th. I, I have the Pelicans at 22nd, Pacers at 21st. So that's my... I think that's like that's probably the end of the tier. We could say like sixteen to twenty-two for me. Is that where you mm -hmm. where do you have the Pacers and Pelicans and Suns? Uh Suns I have at nineteen, Kings at mm -hmm. twenty, Pels at twenty-one. I've got a, a mini surprise with the Detroit Pistons at twenty-two. Um and then I have the Pacers at twenty-three. Interesting. So I, I just want to say, I think this is the year that she hits the fan for the Pelicans defensively. Well, they've, they've been churning out like top 10 units the last couple of years against all odds, you know? So, I mean, they, okay. So the theory of their team is like, we're going to use all these like really lengthy wings. We're going to not let you break the shell. We're going to force a lot of these kick out threes. Um, and then because we have so much length, you know, we, we somehow are the only team in the NBA who can affect Wide open three point shots. Okay. And of course, well, Herb, you know, Herb makes plays, baby. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Um, <laughs> back to back years, you know, the lowest opponent shooting on wide open three point percentages. And I do, I, I do believe maybe like to some degree they are affecting those shots a little bit better than everybody else in the league. But that can't, if that normalizes right there. That's a couple points off their defensive rating they're already in all I, the pack. yeah I, I don't know where and they rank in limiting corner three attempts but i imagine they, they, do, they allow a lot of them they, they allow do. a lot of them oh, yeah God. because the, their whole philosophy is you know we don't have a good rim protector we can't allow shots at the rim so we have to sell out everything to make sure that there's no shots at the rim being taken because we can't alter them when they get to the rim and so 
They lose Najee Marshall, lose Dyson Daniels. They bring in DeJounte Murray, who has not been a good defender in a long time, right? Um, they don't it's just like this team's all funky. This team's so funky. And they need they need to trade Brandon Ingram so bad and like restore balance on their team because they do have Trey Murphy and Herb Jones, and I love the hell out of both of them, but they're being wasted right now on a funky roster. Um yeah. yeah. The Suns, I, I think go ahead, sorry. No, I the Pels it is a bummer because they should be like their vibe should be amazing mm-hmm. and they are not. And that bothers me. The the Ingram thing, I part of me wants this to be sort of everyone getting worked up over not so much. Cause you know, even last year. Ingram and Zion underperformed when they played together. But when Zion was on the court and Ingram was off, they were very, very good. When Ingram was on and Zion was off, they were very, very good. And that core, DeJounte accepted for what you want to say with it, they have played together a lot. So to go from 6th to 20th, and I have in the same place you are. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate a little Mm -hmm. bit. You're banking a lot on loss of Daniels, who is only a sporadic rotation player anyway, but the loss of Najee and the loss of Larry Nance, you know, and even Valanchunas for all of his limitations, still a really, really good rebounder. Better than Ty, better than Ty's, Thice or yeah. whatever his name is, yeah. and Misi. And so, you know, it's a lot of the loss of that sort of supplementary stuff around their core and trying to replace it with like increased jordan hawkins minutes or whatever and like that that stuff will come at a cost there's no question i you know i think this zion at center experiment i still think they don't know what they want to do if they really want to try that and like i saw there was a report that like herb jones was going to be their center and everything like i think they still don't know who their five is really going to be and how many centers they want to play and who like how much they're going to play Messi. And I just have to believe that they are going to stress themselves too much. You know, that DeJounte trade was quite the swing from them. And I understood why they did it because they wanted to address that sort of that. I think they thought they would have DeJounte and then they'd find a home for Ingram Mm -hmm. and they'd have more two-way balance. But now that they don't, they now have three players in Zion, DeJounte and uh, Ingram who want the ball, you know, who are better with the ball in their hands, have real drawbacks as off ball players and trying to cobble that together while being undersized and with someone playing center, who's never played center before on defense. Like, I just think it's going to be too hard, but that said, if Tice comes in, is just like a boring 20 minutes a night and he's stable enough, then maybe instead of 20th, maybe they're like 13th. I don't know, but I, I have trouble seeing it the same way that you do. Yeah, I think um, I put the sun slightly above them just because Budenholzer trust him. Yeah. Um, and then and if if Don can hit shots and they can reap the benefits of his Dude. defense. Dude, yeah, yeah. That's going to that's gonna be really helpful. So that's why I kind of have them in the middle of the pack right now. I, I'd like to put them – like a bit higher than where they have them. We kind of skipped over the uh, Clippers, at least on my list, but with Derek Jones and Batum and Mm -hmm. Zubats is now like a veteran and a very good rebounder. I, and you know, Chris Dunn underrated pickup for them. I think Mm -hmm. he's going to play and he's going to be good. Uh, They have the personnel to just sort of compete. And if Kawhi plays 40 games, then that will raise the level of their defense. Even if it's only for half the season, Uh, the Suns. Ryan Dunn looks awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So happy that he looks like he's going to get an NBA role right away. Um, that said, it's still a lot of Beal and Booker. And Durant had a good defensive year last year, but man, he played 75 games. And I just cannot imagine he makes it 75 again. And so you're they will be small a lot of the time if he misses any time now Royce O'Neal still a serviceable defender uh and I guess I I thought I guess they had Nasir Little but they let him go so Nasir yeah he's on the the team now he's on the heat so yeah I I would like to 
think that Budenholzer can scheme them into the top half of the league, but Nurkic also played a ton of games last year and he normally misses time and they mm-hmm. still don't really have a serviceable backup behind him. It just, it feels thin, feels hard to bank on the health with that team. And so yeah. that's where we've got them. Yeah. And then my other thing is like your two biggest off season signings are both like six foot guards. I just don't know how much that helps right. you on defense. Yeah. I, um, I agree. They're going to be small. You know, yeah. and Brad Beal is small just because I think he's a bad defender. So you have a small point guard and then a bad defender and then Booker's small at the three. It's a lot of minutes to commit to that sort of structure, you know. Yeah. Um, it's Pacers, I don't really have much to say about them right now. Not at this this dark of an hour. I think they're they're fine. They're getting better. I like Nemhard. I think Siakam's a little bit overrated on defense at this point. I think ne- Smith's like, a good defender, but he's not good enough to be your number one perimeter stopper. Yeah, and then he's Turner's a try, a he's a try hard, point. a fun try yeah. hard. But yeah, yeah. we'll see what yeah. Jarris can do. He's their sort of X factor. And maybe yeah, I agree. Rank. I agree with that hundred percent. So um, you had the Pistons at twenty three. You said twenty two or twenty three, and now okay. it's all close to the same. We're getting to okay. the end of the serious teams, but yeah. So my thinking with the Pistons, let me let me just say this before I give the floor to you is I don't. I get like the star of it all. I don't know how much time he's going to miss the blood clots. I also don't know how much he's going to play just because of the spacing conundrum he provides. Uh, I think that might factor into his playing time a little bit, but I think they added a lot of one-way guys in Beasley, Tobias, and Tim Hardaway Jr. And I think that'll make them a better team, but it'll make them better on offense. I still think they're going to be a pretty, pretty bad defense. I don't, I, I, Duran didn't move me in the preseason game I caught. Um, their backup center situation is weird. I still I know Ivy's look good in the preseason, but I'm not I'm not sold on him as like your primary point of attack stopper. Yeah. Yeah. I look 22 to 23. I'm not mm. predicting any great shakes for them. I just uh I think hopefully Asar does come back, but mm. I think in Ivy, well, Cade mainly, because Cade's gonna be their best perimeter defender if Asar is out. Mm. Um I want, I really w- hope that with the offensive infusion that they've gotten and the fact that Bickerstaff is their coach and he's just like a serious and competent defensive coach that he'll help Duran out with his positioning. It Like it won't just be such a mess. Duran is like a really good rebounding prospect. He's strong as hell. And he also has been very, very young. He came in the league young. So even though his positioning has been an adventure, he can do things that other center, like that are good, positive things relative to other centers. He just needs to be in the right spot. So if there's just a, a step towards average there, you know, Isaiah Seward is a backup five. He'll rebound the hell out of the ball. And I just, I expect them to be less bumbling. And I think if this team is less bumbling and Cade is not so stressed on offense, then his defensive talent, which to me is real, not all defense worthy, but Mm -hmm. real uh, and a very good communicator and everything that I think now they have the size, some athletic juice and bigs who are just creeping up enough to push themselves out of the dregs. And that's mainly my bet is that they'll be out of the dregs on the defensive side of the ball. Dregs. Is that where the hipsters hang out? Have you not heard that word, Matt? Do you not know what dregs means? I'm killing you today. <laughs> just... No, I'm the dregs is Chicago. The dregs is Brooklyn. The dregs is DC. The dregs okay, is Portland. So... I mean, po- I, Portland has better defensive personnel than like 27th mm-hmm. or whatever, but I I don't know. I don't no. I don't like I mean it just I like Denny. I like Klingon. I think that those guys are a good defensive investment in the team. Yeah. I just think that they are. There's a lot of Jeremy Grant minutes before they trade him. There's a lot of DeAndre Ayton minutes before they trade him. Those guys aren't terrible per se, but with revolving everything around Scoot and then Simons when he comes, or and and Simon. Simons is healthy. Mm. Sharp's the one that's hurt. I just think it's going to be hard. I think that's going to. And I think they're going to turn the ball over a lot. They'll be back in transition a lot. I just think it's going to be hard. So those are the dregs to me. Is there any okay, other team so yeah. you think is worth discussing? 
Yeah, so I had, I'll just read my 23 30. I actually had the Trailblazers at 23rd. I think that combination of Denny, Kamara, um, Clint again, just like, you know, it's, not, it's a lot of pretty solid athletic defensive players. I don't know. I'm just having my 23 right now. 24, the Raptors, 25, the Hornets, 26, the yeah. Nets, yeah. 27, the Pistons, 28, the Jazz, 29, the Wizards, and then 30, the Dregs. There you go. Chicago Bulls. <laughs> I guess we, bad. so bad I guess I guess the Hornets might want to be good they might try to be competitive um they're just still very young like mm. Miller is young and skinny LaMelo is still young and still skinny I um, was yeah you're gonna laugh I was thinking about putting them higher and then I saw I was on Twitter and I'm like I saw Trey Mann's been playing good in the preseason. I'm like, oh no, he's yeah. gonna be playing a lot of minutes. No, never mind the defense. Yeah, and like I think, so, I'm happy for Trey Mann, by the way. Salah, who I didn't think was gonna play mm -hmm. much, looks like he will play a little bit, mm -hmm. and he's fun. But he also is just so young. Like they are so young, and it's they're gonna make young person mistakes. They'll have a coaching staff that's more invested than Clifford probably was, which is nice. But uh, still no real standout defender on that team. And uh, there's someone else that was mentioned that in your 23-30 I thought was worth. Raptors? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the Raptors. Um, I have them, I think, 24th. And I like them too. And I actually kind of wanted to put them higher. Um, what do you think of them? It just really tapers off after the starting lineup. Like, you know, I think quickly – Solid defender for his position. Obviously, Barnes is a good defender. Um, you have Olenek, position position god. Um, mm -hmm. And then Pirtle hopefully can, you know, go back to being like an average defensive center. And then after that, it's kind of like, you know, you have Grady Dick. You have Oche, Oche Abaji. You know, Dick's good help defender, nail defender. Abaji is like a solid on ball guy, um, strong, physical, but then it's like, what else is there really defensively? Uh, they got the kid out of Baylor whose name is Jacoby Walters. He's very raw, really good nail defender, at least the tools to be one, but on ball still got some, some things to work out. And then it's like, kind of, you know, like what else is there? They got Shad. my guy, Jonathan Mogbo. If he ever okay. plays, he's a good defender, okay. but I mean, this is, he won't play cause he doesn't. Yeah. Shoot. So, uh, yeah, I, they're the kind where I have them, I think, 24th or 25th, and they could be like 19th, you know, just if they're starting five really stays healthy because Pirtle is that steady. And I think quickly in Barnes mm -hmm. and like RJ strong and entering his prime. Like oh, they, yeah, they could, yeah, they, they could cobble some stuff together, but uh, I guess I just worry about their spacing on offense being bad enough to where they're constantly trying to get back on defense, you know, and putting themselves in bad positions. Maybe I guess that was my thought, but they could be better. They could be better than like the mid twenties. I'll you know? say, you know, this is not for defense. I think this is the team at large, but um, they're kind of like the Spurs of the Eastern conference where it's like the starting lineup. I look at them like, you know, this team pretty respectable. Like they can hang with other teams and, you know, give them some fits. Um, but then you like look at the bench and you're like, okay, this is where this is where teams are gonna get their licks in on them. You know, this is where this is where they go from like a low 40 win team to like a low 30 win team. Yeah, they'll probably trade away some talent too. Yeah. Uh, with Bruce and Olenek there. Uh yeah. Well, okay. Any other overriding, you know, thoughts on where we've gone here? Any team that you're now reconsidering after having talked through it all? Uh, the Rockets one's interesting to me. I think you talked me into that. Oh, it's just hard because, like, I don't know. I just don't know what I want to do with them this year. But um, there's them. Um, That's really the big one you sold me on. The Magic I'm kind of worried about now because, like you said, they do foul a lot. Their offense is still problematic. Eh, they're all, they're going to be good. Magic are going to be good. Especially in the same period. I don't know if season. I like that. I don't know if I like them at two or one. I have them as like a one candidate. Like I think they could be the number one defense in the league. Uh -huh. That I would be surprised about if they were all the way there. But yeah. you know, I don't. Have, I have them in that tier. You know, stranger yeah. things have happened. They when they really made up a ton of ground in like February, March, April last year. 
their schedule was kind of soft, but like that's when other teams start waving the white flag. Mm-hmm. And if you're in that circumstance, like you're going to have an awful time playing the Orlando Magic because they, you know, they play so hard every night. I imagine they will be really good during that stretch again, but maybe between now and Christmas, the Magic are like eighth on defense and that is a surprise and really brings them down or something like that. That's sort of how I would think it happens, but. Yeah. Um, Anything else? No, I think I like, I like hearing your, cause I feel like we're pretty much in the same, like when I do mine, I'm like, am I just stupid? Like, is this just a dumb list? And then I see yours. I'm like, okay, it's either we're both stupid or maybe on to something here. So, yeah. I don't, I, you know, you know, we'll worst. find out, Matt. I'm not really, so, I mean, you, know, you said our, you're, What's up? It's our first podcast, as and we're both lawyers now. Oh, congratulations, man! Yeah, yeah. I suppose. I said, so "How do you? You feel different? You feel smarter?" No, I feel worse. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't. That's how it goes. I don't. I don't know. I, I. A lot of people talk down on the profession. They're like, "Oh, why did you choose this line of work?" I don't feel that way about it. Mm. But it is nice to just to get to talk about hoops. That's a lot of fun. All right, man. Well, what do you have coming up that the people can look forward to? Just season preview stuff. Nothing crazy. I'm going to try to get an article in about Ronnie James before the start of the season, but I don't know. We'll see. But I'm more just ready to gear up for the season, watch a lot of hoops, think a lot of things, write some of them down. Um, I'm excited for all that. You want to make, since you're on my podcast right now, you want to make some all rookie predictions? All rookie right now. First team all rookie. You want to oh, give me no, five I, names? I, I need I need a, I need some time. Well, okay. How about we'll do it this way. Do you think Zach Eady will be first team all rookie? Yeah. Yeah. Do oh, you yeah. think that Reed Shepard will be first team all yeah. rookie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's two. Do you think that uh I bet you would say no to Ron Holland, correct? Yeah. Do you think I Steph Castle no. will be first team all rookie? No. No. Do you think Dalton Connect will be first team all rookie? No. No. Jeez. Only got two. You think Ryan Dunn will be first team all rookie? That's a recency bias. It's it's, it's poking at. You think right Zachary Reese Shea will be first team all rookie? Oh, do you think Alex Sar will be first team all rookie? No, no. I I take Reese Shea over him for sure. Okay. So we got like two and a half names. God, what about Jalen Tyson? I like him out of Cleveland. You think he'll play? Yeah, enough to be first team yeah. I kind of, I don't know if he'll play enough, but he, he's got the. If he, if he, if you gave him like, if you gave him a canvas, he'd paint on it for sure. <laughs> what about Klingon? And can, can we get Klingon first team all rookie out of you? No, it wouldn't work. I don't know. This is hard. This is a hard <laughs> class to deal with. Um, I'm trying to think of the guys I really like right now. I thought Dylan I thought Daron Holmes. I, I thought Daron Holmes would have gotten it. Some well, some he's chance. not going to. No, he's not going to get well. Also, get well, Daron. Yeah, get run, uh, get well. I'm trying to like the draft is like. I think Devin Carter would have. I he, he would have. I love Devin to death. Yeah, that's yeah. a great pick by the Kings. That yeah. was another thing I was like kind of thinking about in the back of my mind. I'm like when this guy comes back, they got their own Derek White on defense. They I. Yeah, I got to control myself because we're two hours into this podcast. But yes, I mean, I had Devin. It's getting late, too. I had Devin ranked fifth. And even with his injury, I feel like I should have been higher on him. So, yeah. No one on the Jazz. Collier. uh, Oh, Cody Williams. Jada's brother. Yeah, I think Cody will be on. First team. Okay. So we got Cody Williams, Zach Eady, Reed Shepard, Zachary Risache, Jalen Tyson. Those are the five you want to go with? No, 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 Tyson. I said he's not going to get the chance to paint. <laughs> Khalil Ware. Derek White yeah. with a jumper. Yeah, let's go. Listen let's go Wendy. Where. Let's go Ware. Okay. There's your official predictions. That was, was that so hard? Yeah, okay. it was. Now that sucked. <laughs> now I'm going to actually study these rookies and be like, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> it's this like, is when, you, you know, you find out how much of a hipster you really are. Yeah. Good, so though. I was like, then my favorite one recently is like I saw everybody tweeting about Gigi Jackson. I'm like, oh, here we go again. This guy probably can't tell his left foot from his right foot. And then my co-host Alex makes what? a video on him. My co-host Alex, I never watched. I watched Gigi play one game at South Carolina, and I was scouting somebody else, and I wasn't really on the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, I stopped watching the Grizzlies once he started playing because you know he didn't play barely at all in the first half of the season. 
Mm-hmm. That's when I was watching them. So I'd stop watching them for a little while, see all this stuff on Twitter about his scoring outbursts. I'm like, oh, classic case of empty calorie score, right? Like I've been there, been there, done that. And then I see it. my my co-host Alex make a video, and I'm like, man, is Alex like losing his fastball? Like, do I need to be worried here? And then I started watching Gigi, and I'm like, holy Christ, this guy is awesome! Like he's <laughs> like, I've never seen anyone move like that before. Like he has the most. I'm telling you the most unorthodox movement patterns I've ever seen in my life. Did you ever watch um, Naruto? You watch any anime? No. Okay, I, then you won't get the reference. But like he's not enough he's of a remind- hipster. Yeah. No, you're not. You wouldn't get it. Hipsters do love anime. I'll say that. <laughs> you know him best, man. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, how about you plug your own podcast? What are you and Alex covering? Next? Oh, the, we're on uh, the media pass. Um, I don't know what the next episode would be about. We just did an episode about power rankings, the entire league. So you can check that out. Um, we talk a little bit about defense. Defense is important. I gave a spicy take about the Atlanta Hawks, who I think are going to be a little bit surprising this year. But yeah, the media pass, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify. Spotify. We're going to be back to it once or twice a week now that the season's up. We were on a little bit of a hiatus, but me and Alex Hoops makes YouTube videos. Really cool guy. A little bit less scatterbrained than me. Mm. It's a good dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Again, fan sided, opta analyst, basketball insider, and Forbes, a man of many employers, but one that is a great friend of this podcast. Thank you for doing this late night with me, Matt. I think the uh, product will reflect the time at which this was recorded. Uh, have fun tomorrow. Have a good time in Dallas. You're interviewing Derek Lively and PJ Washington. We'll make sure to check that out. Thank you all very much for listening. This has been Chucking Dart. It's okay to be wrong about sports. Find your dartboard and start chucking. Thank you.